This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Lesson 2, The Message of Hebrews, ready for teaching on January 8. It's authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University, and your reader for today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 1, 2022. Welcome to the new year. But before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that... At the beginning of this new year, we can come to you as we go into the second week of our studies on the book of Hebrews, as we search there for meaning in life, meaning in our salvation, but also to uphold the fact that Jesus came and lived and died, rose again, and is our advocate for our salvation. And as we open your word We just want to thank you that the Holy Spirit can guide our thoughts and our thinking and that our hearts may be turned toward Jesus and that we may follow you all the days of our lives. We pray today for every person who's listening that they may not only know you but their their family may be blessed as well and that their witness may be such that others will want to see Jesus. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter chapter 8 and verse 1. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Let's read that again. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A Jewish document written a few decades after Hebrews, around AD 100, contains a prayer. All this I have spoken before you, O Lord, because you have said that it was for us that you created the world. And now, O Lord, behold, these nations which are reputed as nothing domineer over us and devour us. But we, your people, whom you have called your firstborn, only begotten, zealous for you, and most dear, have been given into their hands. That is found in the Old Testament Pseudepigraphia, page 534. The readers of Hebrews probably felt something similar. If they were God's children, why were they going through such suffering? Thus, Paul wrote Hebrews to strengthen the faith of the believers amid their trials. He reminded them, and us, that the promises of God will be fulfilled through Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, and who will soon take us home. In the meantime, Jesus mediates the Father's blessings to us. So, we need to hold fast to our faith until the end. Sunday, January 2, Jesus is our King. The main point of Hebrews is that Jesus is the ruler, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, as expressed in Hebrews 8 1, our memory text for this week. As God, Jesus always has been the ruler of the universe, but when Adam and Eve sinned, Satan became the ruler of this world, as we read in John 12.31, Now is the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And John 14.30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. And John 16.11, of judgment, because the ruler ruler of this world is judged. Jesus, however, came and defeated Satan at the cross, recovering the right to rule those who accept him as their saviour. 
Colossians 2, 13-15 And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The first two chapters of Hebrews focus especially on the inauguration of Jesus as King. Read Hebrews chapter 1 verses 5 to 14. What is happening here? And beginning at verse 5, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers of flame of fire? But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? These verses are arranged in three sections. Each section introduces an aspect of the enthronement ceremony of the Son. First, God installs Jesus as the royal Son in verse 5. Second, God introduces the Son to the heavenly court, who worship Him in verses 6 and 8, while the Father proclaims the eternal creatorship and rule of the Son in verses 8 to 12. Third, God enthrones the Son, the actual conferral of power over the earth in verses 13 and 14. One of the most important beliefs of the New Testament is that in Jesus God fulfilled his promises to David. Let's look at those promises in 2 Samuel 7 and Luke chapter 1. Firstly, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 to 16. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously." since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for ever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established for ever before you. Your throne shall be established for ever." and Luke 1, 30-33. Then the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
Jesus was born from the line of David in the city of David, as we read in Matthew 1, verses 1 to 16, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah, Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, and Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Isaiah. Isaiah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Sheltiel, and Sheltiel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abiud, and Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And Luke 2, verses 10 to 11. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord." During his ministry, people often called him Son of David. He was executed under the charge that he claimed to be the King of the Jews, as we read in Matthew 27, 37. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Peter and Paul preached that Jesus had risen from death in fulfilment of the promises made to David, as we read in Acts chapter 2, 22 to 36. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption." This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And Acts chapter 13, verses 22 to 37. And when he had removed him, he raised up from him David as king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. 
From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a saviour, Jesus, after John had first preached, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. And John identified Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5 verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Hebrews, of course, concurs. God has fulfilled his promises to David in Jesus. God gave him a great name. In Hebrews 1 verse 4 we read, Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He installed him as his own son. We've already read in Hebrews 1 verse 5. Affirmed him forever as creator and Lord in verses 8 to 12. And seated him at his right hand in verses 13 to 14. Furthermore, according to Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus leads the people into the rest of God, and we are reminded that Jesus is the builder of the house of God in Hebrews 3, 3 and 4. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honour than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God." Jesus, then, is the legitimate ruler of this earth, engaged in a war with Satan, the usurper, for our allegiance. And so to finish the day, how can we draw comfort, especially amid trials, from knowing that Jesus is the ruler of the universe? Monday, January 3. Jesus is our mediator. An interesting concept in the Old Testament theology is that the promised Davidic king would represent the nation before God. Compare Exodus 4, 22 and 23 with 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 14, Deuteronomy 12, 8 to 10, and 2 Samuel 7, 9 to 11, and Deuteronomy 12 verses 13 and 14 with Psalm 132 1 to 5 and 11 to 14. What promises to Israel would be fulfilled through the promised Davidic king? First of all, Exodus 4 
beginning at verse 22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, Let my first son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. And Second Samuel seven twelve to 14 When your days are fulfilled, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the blows of the sons of men." And Deuteronomy 12, beginning at verse 8, You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you may dwell in safety and Second Samuel 7, verses 9 to 11. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. And Deuteronomy 12, verses 13 to 14. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. And now we'll look at Psalm 132 and verse 1 to 5. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. And verses 11 to 14, The Lord has sworn in truth to David, you will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body, if your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne for evermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place for ever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Israel was God's son, and God would give the Israelites a place where they would rest from their enemies. God also would choose a place among them where his name would dwell. These promises for Israel would now be fulfilled through the promised Davidic king. He would be adopted as God's son, God would give him rest from his enemies, and he would build the temple for God in Zion, where God's name would dwell. This means that God will fulfill his promises to Israel through the promised Davidic king. The Davidic king would represent Israel before God. The insertion of a representative in the relationship between God and Israel made the perpetuation of their covenantal relationship possible. The Mosaic Covenant required the faithfulness of all Israel to receive God's protection and blessings, as we read in Joshua 7, verses 1 to 13. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding their cursed things. For Achan, the son of Kamai, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not 
Weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai struck down thirty-six men. For they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan! O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it, and surround us, and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand up before their enemies, but turned their back before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction." Neither will I be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in our midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. The Davidic covenant, however, secured God's covenantal blessings upon Israel through the faithfulness of one person, the Davidic king. Unfortunately, for the most part, the Davidic kings were not faithful, and God could not bless Israel as he wanted. The Old Testament is filled with accounts of just how unfaithful many of those kings actually were. The good news is that God sent his son to be born as the son of David, and he has been perfectly faithful. Therefore, God is able to fulfill in him all the promises he made to his people. When God blesses the king, all his people share in the benefits. This is why Jesus is the mediator of God's blessings to us. He is the mediator in that he is the channel through whom God's blessings flow. Our ultimate hope of salvation is found only in Jesus and what he has done for us. So to finish the day, think about how often you have been unfaithful to your end of the covenant. What does this teach us about how we must rely solely on Jesus for salvation? Tuesday, January 4, Jesus is our champion. Compare 1 Samuel 8, 19 and 20 and Hebrews 2, 14 to 16. What did the Israelites look for in a king? And how were these wishes fulfilled in Jesus? 1 Samuel 8, beginning at verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Hebrews 2, 14-16, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. The Israelites wanted the king to be their judge and their leader in battle because they forgot that God was their king. 
the complete restoration of God's rule over his people, came with Jesus. As our king, Jesus leads us in the battle against the enemy. Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 16, describes Jesus as the champion of weak human beings, as we've just read. Christ faces and defeats the devil in a solo combat and delivers us from bondage. This description reminds us of the battle between David and Goliath. After being anointed as king, where you can read that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, David saved his brethren from slavery by defeating Goliath. The terms of engagement determined that the winner of the combat would enslave the people of the other party as we read in 1 Samuel 17, verses 8 to 10. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But... If I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Thus David acted as a champion of Israel. He represented them. Read Isaiah chapter 42 verse 13 and Isaiah 59, 15 to 20. How does Yahweh describe himself in these passages? Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. And Isaiah 59, verses 15 to 20. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal and a cloak according to their deeds. Accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 16 alludes to the notion that God would save Israel in a solo combat. Note this passage from Isaiah 49:25. For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. As Christians, we often think that we are engaged in a solo combat with Satan. When we read Ephesians 6, 10-18, we see that, yes, we are in combat with the devil, but God is our champion, and he goes to battle before us. We are part of his army. That is why we have to use his armour. Also, we do not fight alone. The you in Ephesians 6 is plural. We as a church take the armour and fight together behind our champion, who is God himself. Let's read Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so, to finish today, what does it mean to put on the armour of God? That is, in our daily struggles with self, temptation and so forth, how can we avail ourselves of the power that enables us through God's strength to be faithful? Wednesday, January 5. Jesus is our High Priest. Hebrews chapters 5 to 7 introduces a second function of Jesus. He is our High Priest. The author explains that this fulfills a promise God had made to the promised Davidic king that he would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's have a look at Psalm 110 and verse 4, and then we'll look at Hebrews 5, 5 and 6. Psalm 110, beginning at verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And Hebrews 5, beginning at verse 5, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, as he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Read Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, Leviticus 10, verses 8 to 11, Malachi 2, 7, Numbers 6, 22 to 26, and Hebrews 5, 1 to 4. What functions did the priest fulfill? Leviticus 1, verses 1 to 9, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And Leviticus 10 verses 8 to eleven. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute for ever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the law has spoken to them, by the hand of Moses, and Malachi 2, verse 7, For the lips of a priest shall keep knowledge, and people shall seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And then Numbers 6, beginning at verse 22, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. 
Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And Hebrews chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He shall have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honour to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. The priests were appointed on behalf of human beings to represent them and mediate their relationship with God and the things pertaining to him. The priest was a mediator. This was true of any system of priesthood, whether Jewish, Greek, Roman, or any other. The priest makes it possible for us to relate to God, and everything the priest does has the purpose of facilitating the relationship between us and God. The priest offers sacrifices on behalf of human beings. The people cannot bring these sacrifices to God in person. The priest knows how we can offer an acceptable sacrifice, so that our gifts may be acceptable to God, or so that they can provide cleansing and forgiveness. Priests also taught the law of God to the people. They were experts in God's commandments and were in charge of explaining and applying them. Finally, the priests also had the responsibility of blessing in the name of Yahweh. Through them, God mediated His good will and beneficent purpose for the people. However, in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, we see something else. We, believers in Jesus, are called a royal priesthood. As it says in 1 Peter 2 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This role implies incredible privileges. Priests could approach God in the sanctuary. Today, we can approach God through prayer with confidence, as we read in Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, which reads, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Hebrews 10, 19-23, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. There are as well important responsibilities. We must collaborate with God in his work of saving the world. He wants us to teach and explain God's laws and precepts to others. He also wants us to offer sacrifices of praise and good works, which are pleasing to Him. What a privilege, and what a responsibility! And so to finish today, what difference should it make in our lives that we are indeed a royal priesthood? How should this truth impact how we live? Thursday, January 6. Jesus mediates a better covenant. Hebrews chapters 8 to 10 focuses on the work of Jesus as the mediator of a new covenant. The issue with the old covenant was simply that it was only a foreshadowing of the good things that would come. 
Its institutions were designed to prefigure, to illustrate the work that Jesus would do in the future. Thus the priests prefigured Jesus, but they were mortal and sinners. They could not provide the perfection that Jesus did, and they ministered in a sanctuary that was a copy and shadow, as it says in Hebrews 8 verse 5, of the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus ministers in the true sanctuary and provides us access to God. The sacrifices of animals prefigured the death of Jesus as a sacrifice on our behalf, but their blood could not cleanse the conscience. Jesus' blood, however, purifies our conscience, and through him, having faith in him and accepting his mediatory work in our behalf, we can approach God with boldness, as we read in Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Read Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 to 12. What did God promise to us in the new covenant? Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more." By appointing Jesus as our High Priest, the Father inaugurated a new covenant that will accomplish what the old covenant could only anticipate. The new covenant delivers what only a perfect, eternal, human, divine priest can. This High Priest not only explains the law of God, but also implants the law in our hearts. This Priest offers a sacrifice that brings forgiveness. This Priest cleanses and transforms us. He transforms our hearts from stone to flesh, as we read in Ezekiel 36.26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He really creates us anew, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This priest blesses us in the most incredible way, by providing us access into the very presence of the Father himself. God designed the Old Covenant in order to point to the future, to the work of Jesus. It was beautiful in its design and purpose, yet some misunderstood its purpose. Unwilling to leave the symbols, the shadows, and embrace the truths that the symbols were pointing to, they missed the wonderful benefits that Jesus' ministry offered them. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 165, Christ was the foundation and life of the temple. Its services were typical of the sacrifice of the Son of God. The priesthood was established to represent the mediatorial character and work of Christ. The entire plan of sacrificial worship was a foreshadowing of the Saviour's death to redeem the world. There would be no efficacy in these offerings when the great event toward which they had pointed for ages was consummated. End of quote. Friday, January 7. 
Despite all the good and hopeful truths in the book of Hebrews, there also is a series of warnings that reach their climax in chapters 10 to 12. These sections have at least two common elements. First, they all compare the desert generation with the readers of Hebrews. Second, they exhort us to have faith. The desert generation was the one that saw the amazing power of God unleashed in signs and wonders in their deliverance from Israel. They also heard God speak from Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. They saw the column of fire in the night and the protecting cloud during the day. They ate manna, bread from heaven. They also drank water that sprang from the rocks wherever they camped. But when they arrived at the border of the promised land, they were not able to trust God. They lacked faith, which is the core of what God requires. As it says in Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please Him. Paul says that we, like the desert generation, also are at the border of the promised land, as you read in Hebrews 10, verses 37 to 39, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to petition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. Our privileges and responsibilities are greater, however. We did not hear God speak at Mount Sinai, but we have seen through Scripture a revelation of God greater than the one at Mount Zion. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, as we read in Hebrews 12, 18 to 24. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The question is, Will we have faith? Paul encourages us to follow the example of a great list of characters, which culminates with Jesus himself. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, we have learned that Jesus is our champion who goes before us into the battle against the devil. How can we fight together, united as a church, behind our champion? What are those things that prevent this unity from happening? What are ways that Satan can weaken us as a church? How did Satan weaken Israel in the past? 2. As believers, we are a community of priests under God's direction. In what ways can your local church offer better sacrifices of praise and good works to God? Please be specific and practical. 3. In what ways is our situation similar to the situation of the desert generation just before crossing into the promised land? What lessons can we learn from the similarities? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Miraculous Rock. It's by Andrew McChesney. A miracle rock stopped the pickup truck of Bunprani Vanadi, who was serving as president of the Seventh day Adventist Church in Laos. It was just an ordinary creek. Any car could pass through its shallow waters easily. No car was known to have ever gotten stuck there. But the pickup truck decided to stop just as it entered the creek. It simply stopped. 
Bernpony and two young pastors travelling with him found a rock blocking the way, but it seemed to be too small to stop the vehicle. Just to make sure, they moved the rock and tried to restart the vehicle. It refused to start. They hailed down a passing car and tried to jump start the battery, but the pickup truck still refused to start. Since it was getting dark, Bernpony walked to the nearest village. Several villagers came back to the pickup truck to help, but they couldn't get it to start. The village chief invited Bunpreni to spend the night in his house, while the young pastor stayed with the pickup truck. What are you doing in our area? The village chief asked. Bunpreni explained that he was taking some sporting equipment to the next village. He was hoping to establish a connection with that village. As he listened, the village chief sensed that Bunpreni was a Christian, and he announced that he was a Christian. He pulled out a Voice of Prophecy Correspondence School certificate issued by the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Laos several years earlier. He said he had reached out to a former church leader for support several years earlier, but had been dismissed. So now he and about 200 other villagers were worshipping Jesus on their own. He asked Bunpreni to teach him and the villagers about the Seventh-day Sabbath. It was at that moment Bernpreni realised an angel must have stopped the pickup truck. It was like Balaam's donkey, who refused to go farther because it saw an angel of the Lord. This car must have seen an angel of the Lord standing in front of it in the creek, so it decided to stop. The next morning, the pickup truck started at the first turn of the quay. And there's a photograph of the truck with its front wheels in the water. Thank you for your Sabbath school mission offering that will help spread the gospel to the people of Laos and the other countries of the Southern Asia Pacific Division. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open an elementary school in Laos. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.